Hey, good afternoon. This is Jay Frost speaking to you from the uh, Philanthropy Masterminds Series World Headquarters, in other words, my home office. And I'm really happy to see you here. Can't see you actually, but I know you're here. In fact, we've got a great crowd today, people from across the US, and I think some outside, to hear two fantastic presenters on this subject. You can see it already. Close more major gifts using donor search, and I would say probably arguably other screening tools too. Uh, to focus on the right potential donors. You've got two people who have been doing that in lots of different incarnations for numerous institutions over a good number of years. I won't say how many, because it, uh, let's just put it this way. They are experienced folks and they know how to do what they're about to tell you. <laughs> so, but before I go there, I do wanna welcome you in a couple ways. First, uh, to let you know that this series is brought to you by DonorSearch. So our thanks to DonorSearch for providing a platform where we can invite these uh, folks to present and share with you and talk with you. But since we are doing this uh, on uh, the ON24 platform, we cannot see or hear you. However, we do have the Q&A box and we're gonna encourage you to use that for questions throughout. And uh, you'll probably be prompted in a moment by our presenters to just say that you're here and let us know where you're, where you're calling in from. Um, before we do even that, however, I do want to uh, tell you a little bit about our presenters. So no further ado, I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order because I don't know how else to do it actually today. They're both terrific people. One is Dathar, Dr. Catherine Gamble. So hello, Catherine. Hello, uh, she has been, been in the field for nearly three decades and held senior leadership roles at North Carolina Museum of Art, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, St. Mary's School and East Carolina University. She received her MBA from Queens University in Charlotte and completed her PhD in public administration at North Carolina State, where she focused on nonprofit board governance and examining the effects of CEO power and multiple boards on um, uh, role fulfillment. In addition uh, to working at Gail Perry Group, you probably saw that already, and you can see it right there on, this, on the slide, she uh, teaches uh, 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 nonprofit governance and fundraising at Johns Hopkins and is a regular presenter at one of my favorite conferences, Arnova. If you don't know what that is, check it out. That's where the brain trust of our field hangs out, and we've got one of them right here today. We also have a name that I sure hope is familiar to you, one of the leaders in our field, and that is the incomparable Gail Perry. Uh, Gail is, of course, the president of Gail Perry Group, and she's been guiding nonprofits and nonprofit leaders to fundraising success in a whole bunch of ways for decades. She launched her fundraising career at Duke, and then went on to leading uh, fundraising efforts at uh, Kenan Flagler, or is it Kenan Flagler? I never it's know. Um, thank you. <laughs> Kenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's a member of the board of AFP US Foundation for Philanthropy, which I hope you all support. Uh, the North Carolina Botanical Garden and the Friends of the Library uh, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's also the author of a book, which you might see peering out of the corner of her uh, office, uh, and you should have on your shelf too, which is Fired Up Fundraising, Turn Board Passion into Action, which is produced uh, or published rather uh, by Wiley. And she was named just this last year as one of LinkedIn's top voices in philanthropy. So LinkedIn finally woke up and saw who to listen to. We're happy that they did so and happy that you showed up to hear these two great voices, of course, Catherine Gamble and Gail Perry. Welcome. Thank you so much. And everybody, why don't you say hello to us in the chat box? and share your name and your organization and maybe where you're from. And also we'd love to know what you might like out of the session today because we are going to dive down into wealth screening. This is a data technical presentation. If you can believe I'm actually gonna go in that direction, but I have my wonderful, brilliant partner, Catherine Gamble, whose middle name is Data. And she can find the golden nuggets inside a wealth screening report. Catherine, wanna say hello? Hello, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. And let me just add, when Gail talks about finding nuggets, every time we do um, the little sorting exercise, segmentation exercise we're going to talk about today with a client, they find and uncover a major gift prospect and a close a gift. So it, it works. This, this literally will show you how to look, to read the massive amounts of data you get in a wealth screening report and break it out into workable chunks and find the people, find your high opportunity people. We have clients who have made cold calls on, um, on, on a prospect who has identified and the prospect said, I would love to help. How can I help? Six figure gift right there. 
And let's say hello. We've got a lot of people. I see some friends. Sandy McNabb, hello. Peter, how are you from Alaska, Alaska Public Media? Anna's here from Maine General Health. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. We, our consulting company does capital campaigns around the country, and uh, we also work a lot in Canada. And right now, if you see our majorgiftscoaching.com URL, we are um, open to discuss our major gift intensive that we run every year. We have room for 30 organizations. We're about halfway full right now. But if you want to learn, if you want to build up a solid major gift program for your organization, check out that URL and, and we can schedule a call if you're interested in it. Catherine, I'm going to let you take this away. Before Great. I... Well, let's get started with our agenda for today. So we're just going to talk a little bit about what, it, what major gifts today mean, 21st century major gift fundraising. And then we're going to talk about how we organize our data. So data is one of those big four-letter words, but we're going to kind of demystify that for you today. And we'll talk about the benefits of well screening. There's one really key one that we'll, we'll touch on. And then we actually have brought to you today an actual example, a real example, the real numbers of a client screening analysis. And this tells you how to use it, how to make this screening actionable and work for you, how to get it into the, into the field. Um, and then we'll talk about our major gifts by the numbers approach, which is really a key part of your major gift plan. It creates the structure Gail was talking about. It helps you support the discipline that's needed to be successful with major gift fundraising. And we will uh, talk to you about how that plan works. And just a little bit, this sort of, we're not gonna show you all behind the screen of major gifts by the numbers, but this is sort of a sneak peek of how you can set it up to work for you. All right, so let's talk about what it means to be 21st century major gifts, major gifts today. First is it is data driven. We always think about major gifts as so relational that we forget that how we identify major gift prospects, how we move them through the pipeline is all about our data. And we believe very much that major gifts has a fluid approach, meaning that don't, today's major gift donor may not be tomorrow's major gift donor <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> so you have to be nimble and able to kind of, you know, allow your pipeline to actually flow, not always be stuck on the same, same donors all the time. It's very outcomes driven, very focused on an outcome. And I want to be clear about what we mean about an outcome. An outcome means something has changed from point A to point B. So we are, what this, um, what monitoring and the major gifts plan is about is focused on how you change things, the donor relationship being key um, between point A and point B. And then lastly, we believe very strongly, and we talk about this in our coaching program, that major gifts has a team orientation. It requires a strong culture of philanthropy at your organization. Your leadership has to be involved. Your whole development team has to understand what's going on and be supportive of the plan that you develop. And you know, in a way, we all talk about the advent of data, data moving into major gift fundraising and how it's impacting fundraising today. And we're seeing data offer such potential. And the beautiful thing about data is that it, it, it by, by going through this kind of analysis that we're gonna walk you through, step-by-step -step analysis, you bless your hearts, you can focus on the right people and you can bless and release the wrong people. And one of the, the key, Catherine likes to say, one of your greatest resources is your time. And if you can focus your time on the right prospects, just think how you can raise money so much faster. So important. I will make one comment. We were talking to a former um, major gift intensive, our coaching program um, member, who said the bless and release strategy has made all the difference in the world for them. <laughs> That's called fluid approach, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less Your stress, more change. more outcomes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Less stress. I like that. We'll sign up for that. And let me just say that um, here's here's something really interesting to think about. Everything you do in fundraising, all of your activities, all your strategies and tactics, guess what? You're creating data. And hopefully you're recording data so that you can analyze it. Because you're, that's what your donor CRM should be able to do for you is offer you that platform. And Catherine, talk, walk us through the different kinds of um, data that we can develop. Sure. Well, let's talk. We'll move on to this next slide with this, because this is where we're talking about this categories of prospect information. And as Gail was just saying about the previous slide, 
when you're collecting data, this will be you record a gift or you record the date of a gift or you record how much the donor gave. This is all data points. And in this case, the, from, for example, from your annual giving activities, you create this transactional data. And the RFM score, which is recency, frequency, monetary value, how recent has their gift. We talk about uh, donor retention. This feeds into that. Um, we talk about how frequently they've given and then, of course, how much they've given. Very important data. Yeah, I just want to say a little bit about this RFM uh, metric because I used to think, oh, RFM, boring, old news. But the fact is, recency, frequency, and monetary value helps you identify your passionate donors because you can tell how much they're giving, how often they give, how recently they've given. This is a prime prospect, prospect pool for people who are indicated through their gifts, through their transactions, we call it, uh, that they think you are great. Yes, that is. We'll show in the next slide that it's really an indicator of affinity for your organization, that transactional data, the RFM score. And then in the center here, relational data. So if you are a major gift officer or you, or you um, deal with relational fundraising, you're collecting this information. Ho hopefully you're recording your lovely contact or call reports in your CRM. So this is where you're collecting like biographical information. You're understanding what, what really motivates the donor, their values and their passions. And you're also finding out who influences the donor, their affiliations. So it can be their family and their business affiliations, and it can also be their social affiliations. So you're not limited in any way. And so this is just trying to help you kind of put your mindset around what is the data we're really looking to collect. It's time uh, for me to Gail, you got your hat. <laughs> so guess what? Major gift fundraisers have to do this, you know, in presentations. You know, you're supposed to add levity. <laughs> but in major gift presentation um, and work, you're trying to uncover uh, and place your like homes to find out all this information about your donors, and they will tell you if you ask. Mm -hmm. And of course, the number one thing to find out is what's driving them, what really matters to them in their hearts. I used to think uh, they talk about, oh, you have to find your donor's values. And I'm going, what are values? What do you mean? But it really means that what it, what is it exactly that excites the donor about your work that sort of echoes what they deeply believe in. Mm -hmm. Like I was raised in a, in a Southern girl in the Southern patriarchy. <laughs> and so I have like a, um, that's my personal experience. And so I give to women's causes, you know? <laughs> so, so there's something about certain types of causes that speaks to me deeply based on something in my life. And you have donors like that and you're for the fun work. I think Catherine, don't you think? Oh, it's the most fun of all. I've spent my whole career um, when I was in working in, the, in before consulting, being a frontline major gift officer or managing the major gift team. So um, it, this is this is it's like it is like putting on that sleuth hat like you had, <laughs> Kale, and really just finding out. And it's about your you know uh, your authentic interest in other people. Yeah. And then our last category, of course, is screening data. So in this case, we'll talk about donor search specifically here, but any, any screening um, that you do, you will find these types of things. Everybody wants to know about wealth indicators, but we'll talk about how you need to use those. And then also philanthropy indicators, which is really critical. Are they philanthropic or not? Which you can actually find out from a screening because I think probably everyone on this call understands that wealth alone is not an indicator of philanthropy. And then lastly, uh, various scoring uh, kind of ratings that different screening services use. So propensity sometimes is one or likelihood um, is, an, is one of those ratings. And so what we have done in our conversation about this slide is we have taken this sort of boring four letter word called data and we have brought it alive to you. Like what is behind this data and what's the fun that we have on uncovering the data. So just remember that um, this is the work of discovery and qualification mm -hmm. right here, isn't it, Catherine? It is. And I will say to you all, one of the reasons we want to make sure that you understood the sources of this data is your CRM is full of rich, wonderful mm -hmm. data that is that tells you a lot about how your donors behave, 
their um, what they might be inclined to do. And then if you add screening data to the two you already have, the transactional and relational data, that's like putting the cherry on top of the of the ice cream sundae. Um, Absolutely. That's what well screening <laughs> will do for you. Well, I've got exactly. metaphors today, Catherine. I don't know. I'm having a moment, I guess. <laughs> I don't know, or maybe I just want some ice cream. That could be that could be part of it. <laughs> so if you like, here, if you like how a comment, say hello to us, and and you know, <laughs> tell us you know, like it gives the thumbs up or whatever. Yeah, so we we love to interact with everybody. So here we're just relating what it is you want to know about people. Again, in major gifts, you could really use a lot of this for any level of. But we're going to yeah. stick to major gifts today. Yeah. And so these, the capacity is telling you, again, that's through wealth indicators and uh, external and even philanthropy, giving to your own um, organization is an indicator there. So that's telling you mm -hmm. how much. Affinity, the RFM st uh, score is a goal standard. Um, there have been, there's variations on it offered by very, various screening companies, but it, the RFM remains a goal standard. And whether you have a screening or not, you can actually create a scheme to score your your uh, donor pool itself, <clears throat> excuse me. And many um, CRMs, I think now actually can have maybe have a um, a scoring mechanism within within the CRM itself. So that's telling you how lo loyal your donors are. And then interest, which I keep I'm thinking about replacing with values because that's more important than interest. That's about their philanthropy and that's driving why they give. That's understanding what motivates them. And then lastly, we talked about affiliation. So this is sort of your recipe, if you will, about what you want to know about your major gift donors. And, and here we're going to talk a little bit in here in just a minute about why you want to know these things. And Catherine, you know something? All those data points make me feel tired. This is what we, <laughs> well, what, this is what we hear from major gift fundraisers and their managers is that uh, there's too much data. And they don't know how to sift through it. And we're going to cover that, too, because I don't want you to feel overwhelmed by looking at all these amazing data points that you probably already have access to. But let's let's before we do that, let's talk a little bit about the benefits of, of screening, because mm -hmm. we are we're very high on donor search. If you're not a donor search user. We recommend donor search. We have a partnership with donor search and we um, we have our clients screen their their um, donor files with donor search. And we know how to read the tea leaves. Mm -hmm. And so we'll do it for them. We'll do that. We actually, it's a pretty detailed analysis we do to find that those hidden gems. Mm -hmm. And then we also teach our, whoops, teach our clients how to do it. Yeah. Um, so here is the real reason for screening these, these three things. And mm -hmm. you'll notice, you'll notice, take note that finding wealthy people is not on the list. Okay. Because that is so often what people focus in and they get this long list of, of donors and they just want to read um, capacity indicators. This is what, these are the three things that screening helps us do. One, it saves time. Time is your most limited resource. And if you can create more of it by working smarter, yay. <laughs> and then you, it's, uh, we have a client who's really been dealing with, had a huge increase in the number of donors during the pandemic. And now they're trying to manage this huge new list of new prospects. And so what screening allows you to do is create manageable segments or manageable groups. You know, if you, if you have, were handed a list of thousands of donors, you would just glaze over in a minute. But think about having a nice segment, you know, with clear identifiers, why you have that group of people identified, and it's a couple of hundred or less, you can manage that. And then lastly, and we talked a little bit about it at the beginning, it helps you identify opportunity. So again, that plays into saving time because you're not working harder, you're working smarter. So here we're going to... I'm just looking at the what? time. Piece and I want, okay. I'm just looking at the time, so I want to make sure. I'm probably not going to interrupt you too much here. Okay. All right. <laughs> I've got it right down here. So. Right. Um, so we, so as Gail said earlier, we are a donor search master account holder ourselves. We are a partner with donor search. So we are using a donor search example. If you use another wealth um, screening service, you will find similar information. You can still kind of use this from um, a guy as a guide. 
So in donor search, donor search categorizes donors using these DS ratings. And in this case, the top three, DS1-1 through DS1-3, are have all have indicators of major gift potential. So this is a segment, if you do a donor search screening, that we're going to look at or pay most attention to. And if, again, if you do the screening, what here is donor search's own um, segmentation. So if you really, if you don't go any further than this, this is where you want to go, one place you want to go in the executive analysis, because they're using capacity, which is the DS1-1 rating, or the DS ratings, um, and RFM in this affinity. What I love so much about wealth screening is the addition of First of all, we're pulling, using RFM, as I said earlier, to find your most passionate donors who are giving you the most amount of, mo most amount of money, the most frequently and the most recently. And then you match that with wealth indicators and boom, this is the magic sauce. So this let me, I want to. The ice cream mm -hmm. gathered. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. We must be hungry. We're into all these food metaphors today. <laughs> I'm on a diet. I'm talking about ice cream. What can I say? <laughs> Now that explains why you were cranky earlier today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, so one of the things that Gail was talking about, you notice that create a group and this pie chart and it's three um, quadrants in this one, or three, not quite three quadrants, three sections of this um, pie chart. It's because you're always using two data points, two data points minimally in order to find a group. You do not group your donors in for in terms of um, prospect identification and um, segmentation. You do not do it by gift level or capacity alone. You'll just be reading a list that doesn't mean a lot, except you know all those people gave $5,000. And that's why we don't like the capacity rate um, reports that don't mm -hmm. include other data points, because they don't really tell you what you need to know. Mm -hmm. No. And so here, and I think probably most of you have seen a similar prospect evaluation grid before, but I'm actually going to use the word model here because the minute we start talking about modeling to most frontline major gift fund fundraisers, everybody either looks like deer in the headlights or has no clue what we're talking about or thinks we're talking about advanced analytics and statistical analysis. And we're not. We're talking about a simple chart using two data points, this is a model. So this is similar to the pie chart previous. It's the major gift capacity score, and you can determine what score you want to use, and the affinity score, which is usually RFM. And in this case, what we recommend when we do a donor search screening is to look at the external giving, meaning it's external to your institution, and we'll show you that segmentation in just a moment. But what you'll see here is the upper right-hand quadrant, the high capacity, high affinity, that's likely where your prospects are. So that's kind of the group we say, oh, you should know this group. The, the quadrant below, the high capacity, low affinity, this is where your suspects live. So these are people um, that you haven't gotten to know well, haven't yet demonstrated higher affinity, but have a high capacity and they are giving to you. And these are your Over sleeper leader. These are your sleeper leadership annual fund donors. These are your mm -hmm. sleeper uh, major and principal and capital campaign gift donors. So this is where you, like we say, this is where you spend your discovery time right here. Absolutely. And so what we'll show you today when we go through the screening results is how you turn, how you identify these and how you work through that. Um, and then on the left side are mostly your annual fund people and probably most of your plan giving prospects live in that upper left quadrant. Right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. again, this is a way to model. This is a very simple model for modeling your donor pool and putting them into groups that you can make actionable with the right strategy or the right activity applied to each quadrant. And it may be multiple activities. Mm -hmm. This is and a good way to kind of go ahead. Excuse well, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but we're getting lots mm -hmm. and lots of questions in the chat box about sharing our slides. And mm -hmm. so um, if Jay gives us a list, um, Jay, if you're willing to give us a list of all the attendees, we'll be glad to email these slides to everybody. And we will not put you on our email list mm -hmm. <laughs> unless you might ask us to do so. So happy to share these. Are you okay with that, Catherine? 
Absolutely. That'd be great. We love to talk about and we love to help folks with these people. Gail, you want to talk briefly about our coaching program? This is a little tiny ad because we are in the middle of of opening um, applications for the Major Gifts Intensive. And like I said at the very beginning, we have room for 20, uh, I'm sorry, 30 organizations. But it's a four-month advanced, hands-on, live training and private coaching program to build up and implement a Major Gifts structure, a Major Gifts system, and also the personal skills to um, go through disco- identification, discovery, qualification, and asking. We teach a, a conversational ask approach that is really pretty amazing because our, our our participants in this program are getting, no kidding, gifts thrown at them without being asked. So if you're in slightest bit interested, go to majorgiftscoaching.com, fill out the form, and we're happy to talk to you. We have mega results from so many organizations. We run this program um, every year in the beginning of the year, and then we send you out into the world to change the world through more major and principal gifts. It's a, it's a great program. We both, Gail, I'm, I've been coaching in it now for about three. Is this my fourth year, Gail, with you? Fourth, yeah. I think so. Anyway, it makes so much difference. We get so many, we have, we get so many people who write us and tell us about the gifts they're closing and also in our consulting practice, same thing. And we, again, what we said earlier, I'll tell this quick story about donor search uh, screening. I showed a client how to do the segmentation of getting ready to show you all how to do. And we were looking at that list. We curated it down some and, and she used that list to actually take a smaller segment of the list to talk to her campaign committee and one of the campaign committee members knew someone on this list. Now, this list, this person that was chosen had never given to the more than $75 to the organization. And That's I just want to say also that this is a capital campaign and we are doing their, their campaign that we're their mm-hmm. consultants. And so Catherine did her magic super duper analysis of their West Green report. And Catherine said, go see these two people. I mean, she Catherine mm-hmm. pulled out a very discreet segment for follow up. And so mm-hmm. the board member knew one. So we, we like to take small groups of lists of names to board members and say, do you know any of these people? They really love us and they have wealth. And then what happened, Catherine? They went on one call, one call, $125,000 commitment. Boom. One call. Our so they would not have, we hadn't, yeah, I'm sorry. If we hadn't done this analysis and helped them find that list, they might have gotten to that person eventually, maybe, who knows. But it would have been more like kind of here's the food thing again, Gail, like throwing jello at the wall. <laughs> I, don't <know> <laughs> I don't know if it's gonna stick or not. But, yeah. But they knew yes. this would stick. So because this this they had a, all the right identifiers that we found in the screening in the screening sample. So here's our screening ex- ex- analysis example. And this is actually from a client, one of our campaign clients, not the one I just told you about, but a different one, um, who was really on the front end of building a major gift program before they head into their campaigns in this next year. So what our segment pulling was, we looked at donors who had not given a single gift of 10,000 or more to the organization. Now in the donor search screening table tool, you have your own data in there as well as the external data that has been delivered by donor search. So you have your data there too. So we, so we, so we got this nice, lovely segment of people who had never given more than $10,000 to this client, but we went over to the column with the external, uh, external giving and found, um, don't ask, ask or put in that we wanted gifts, um, Every, people who had given 10000 or more to other organizations. It's fascinating organizations. to do this search. Mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Mm-hmm. People have given over 10000 or more to other organizations, but they're not giving you $10,000. Mm-hmm. So they found 355 donors that fit that category. That means and they had these, an, these, these are great prospects. Mm -hmm. These people have a demonstrated affinity for the organization, your organization, because they've been giving. And they also have a, you know, confirmed philanthropic intent and philanthropic interest. Now, now this is going to put you in this, we call this our high opportunity segment. 
And so the internal giving, meaning the giving to the client from this 355 donors was a little over $190,000. But look at their external giving. Their external likely giving that donor search had found with this group was over 66 million. 355 people with demonstrated philanthropy of over 66 million. And their external political giving, which also associates with philanthropy, was just over 5 million, meaning that there was an opportunity ratio here of 1 to 375. What that means is for every dollar that those, those 355 donors were giving to this organization, they were giving $375 somewhere else. And, you know, we take this to our clients and our clients go, oh, my goodness, let's start with the 355 donors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, somebody asked in the question box, what do we do if, if a donor or a prospect is not receptive to your efforts to reach out? It's called bless and release. If you've got 355 lovely individuals who show promise, you're going to be sifting through this group and you're going to be finding the people who are responsive to an outreach effort mm -hmm. on your part. Mm -hmm. So this is this is sort of like our secret sauce is to do this analysis of the 10,000, 10, not 10,000 to us, but 10,000 to up and up to other organizations. Mm -hmm. And it's your 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 it boggles your mind to see what your donors are giving to other causes. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. So just just show this for a second. Remember the evaluation grid, the model. Well, this is the right side of the model with the actual data from this client graphed onto it. So we see that we think that the, um, pro, you know, the major gift prospects we want them to examine are right there. The, the higher giving levels we put in a special, special um, way they're going to manage those. But we were looking for the opportunity. So we looked at this group. This is the, excuse me, this is the 216 above the line, the people that they should know but you'll find, we'll find out that they don't know, um, with this external giving of about five and a half million dollars. This is a really, really rich potential. So here's what we have you do, because you don't just start with that list. and You have to kind of you know, work a little bit and, and throw in one more data point to this list so you can refine it. This is really important. And so we always have the staff review the list one more time just to be sure that all of the internal giving is correct. And because every once in a while they'll find something's off from their own data and they need to, excuse me, correct it. Or maybe there's a reason that person just should come out altogether. Then we have um, this wonderful scale that Gail invented. <laughs> hot, it's warm, a and cold. Sophisticated, very sophisticated scale called hot, and, warm, and cold. <laughs> And it but, works perfectly. So what mm -hmm. we're trying to do now is sort this group into, are they a prospect? Meaning we have some relationship with them and we can move right into cultivating them. Or are they a suspect? Meaning we have to do discovery work with them first and actually determine, are they the lovely warm prospect that we can move along with? Or as Gail said, do they go in the bless and release strategy for the time being? Or they may go in a back burner because we think there's a, a special role for the back burner group in major gift fundraising because you mm -hmm. can't see everybody all at once. But what we like to do is to take these, as we say, segments, groups, lists, short list of donors that we've identified in these um, reports in your wealth screening and take it to the development team and or they'll work with the board committee. And, and it's one of the things about hot, warm and cold is that board members really understand this, you know, and they understand that we're not going to rush up to a cold prospect and ask them for a six or seven figure gift. They get that. And so remember one of our jo jobs always because is to get board members aligned with major gift strategy and not have them be in front of us or behind us. And yet, and, and they, that one of their uses in fundraising is to help evaluate prospects that they know. So this is a way to use your board members in a productive place where they will not stray and not invent new ideas to keep you overly busy, but they can be very helpful in helping you determine, do we have a relationship with this person or not? Do we have an in, an entry point to go see them? Um, or has nobody ever heard of them? We don't know where they came from. They're going to go into the back burner list or some other group for um, maybe the new fundraising person on the team to get to deal with them. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. 
So this is this is this. So here we'll talk to let's show you what the um, what the result of this refined segmentation went on. So this is a, this doesn't take very long. You get, it's kind of fun to sit around with your group and your staff and determine are they hot, warm, and cold. Um, mm -hmm. So here the internal staff re review they m removed three people from this list. I uh, forget exactly why they did it, but it was appropriate. And then their re relationship rating results were. Hot, you see, they had 12 prospects they considered hot. See, they're on, they're in the nascent stage, or were at this time in the nascent stage of developing um, the ma or their major gift program. They had 49 likely prospects that are warm, and 152 suspects that are cold. And so, one more little thing. Here's what we're doing to make this all actionable: the prospects, the 12 prospects. Move ahead, assign a target ass level, look, estimate a time frame, move them into, you know, actual, you know, relationship building activity, AKA cultivation or using uh, or solicitation stewardship. There are lots of ways to advance. We, we teach the direct conversation that can really advance a relationship very quickly. Um, if you have a whole team assigned to a relationship manager, if you are the person, the one person who does all of this, and you are the relationship manager, you assign them to yourself or you could prioritize them um, based some, on time frame. Some of these prospects were assigned to the CEO because mm -hmm. the CEO already knew them well. And then once we matched up their wealth capacity with their passionate level of giving um, and saw what they were giving to other causes that they were not giving to us, then the executive director or the CEO had a, had a framework or a context um, from which to have conversations with these donors because they, the, the CEO had a sense of what was possible. And mm -hmm. so in a way, it gave him uh, more confidence. It gave him um, um, more, more data to work from, and he, he could be more productive. And, you know, your CEO doesn't have that much time anyway, so we mm -hmm. could focus his, his limited energy in the, in the very exact places. Mm -hmm. I don't want to right. take Jennifer, Jennifer's ask in general, how long does it take to move a cool, cold prospect into warm prospect group? You know, we teach a direct conversational approach to discovery and qualification and asking, and it's very permission-based. It's very oriented toward the donor. And um, you, if, you, if a cold prospect is willing to see you, you can use a series of questions uh, to determine whether they're going to be in the hot category that some of them are. Well, and Gail, that example we gave earlier of our campaign yeah. client who found a sus, a, a, that person was a suspect. Uh, they were a nice donor, but they had not, they were not known. Uh, they were kind of, if you will, anonymous to the, to the staff because they just didn't know who they were. And one visit and they closed a $125,000 gift. Um, so what, what the point of this is, mm -hmm, the point is, is that Rather than trying to guess who you should be seeing, this helps you organize to who you should be seeing and the effort you should be making. So, you know, in this guy, I'm going to finish this up here with the large number of suspects this organization had. Um, and again, this was the group that with the high affinity, high, high capacity. And what's happened here, but they just didn't have a relationship with them. That's why you have to do this relationships uh, assessment. And they are converting those suspects at a pretty high rate to prospects. Because these, uh, these are what we call juicy suspects, <laughs> which is also <laughs> not a very technical term. But again, no, November and, and somehow related to food again. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody asked if Jello was a food. <laughs> <laughs> that may be another webinar. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's only Tuesday. It's only Tuesday. <laughs> we're talking about data. See, we're bringing data. We're making data fun. See, yeah. we can do this. So the suspect pool here in the bottom part of this chart, here is their 139 and their estimated um, giving, external giving here is 4.3 million. Um, and so again, we're going to do the same exact exercise with this same group. We're going to do the staff review again to make sure we don't need to remove anybody from the list um, or correct some kind of information that was maybe um, uploaded incorrectly for the screening. We're going to do the hot, warm, and cold. I can't emphasize enough how important it is for you to determine after you've got these groups what your current relationship status is. So a hot prospect is somebody, if you call them up, they will talk to you. 
you know, those are people you typically have some relationship with or someone in the organization has a relationship. They are hot. They're not going to ever turn down seeing you. Warm is sort of, uh, they might see you sometimes. They might ghost you other times. They're sort of in, on the fence. They could go either way. You just haven't really talked to them enough to really, you know, know if you can really move the relationship forward. Um, and then cold is, is pretty clear what that means. You don't have a relationship with them. But Catherine, um, and I'm talking Virginia mm -hmm. just put in the question box that they find a suspect, a cold suspect from wealth screening, and it, and one phone call resulted in a three hundred fifty thousand dollar gift. So that's why I say these are juicy suspects, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that you should you should feel excited about picking up the phone to make discovery calls with them. And the phone call should be fun. You know, you say, "Oh, Mr. Miss Donor, you know, you are so wonderful to be giving to us. I just want to say thank you and." Please, I'd love to know how you came to be giving to our organization and start the discovery process. Boom. Right. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. It's again, you can see it's like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat on this process. And you can really kind of work through it very quickly, very easily. Um, it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And you know what what to do with each group of people that you that your work results in. Um, here again, they did went back right through the same. Some of their suspects became were pro actually prospects. They just had a lower RFM score, um, and they had again a large number of suspects with it, which they've been working through. And one thing I'll add in our coaching program, we teach you teach uh, our participants how to do discovery, how to conduct the discovery call, um, how to get get in the door, all those things. So. So let's talk a little bit about fundraising by the numbers or in this major gift by the numbers next step. So here again, this is this client. They After they did that um, grouping segmentation work, they had 15 prospects with a signed target ask. It's really important to think what you may be asking the donor. This is not like carved in stone. You know, if you have the capacity, you know something about them, pick a number that you think is the right number or range, ranges work really well, and know that as the relationship goes further, that number can change. So those 15 prospects go in prospect review sessions. Your 60 likely prospects in this case, they would need, really need to kind of put them either in the prospects or the suspect category, category so you want to refine that group. And lastly, you have these 277 suspects. And that this is how you prioritize your suspect list. You want to look at their last gift date. You're going to do much better with people who have recency or high recent, you know, their gift is very recent than somebody who may have given a lot, but their last gift was two years ago. So gift date trumps amount. Okay. Pretty interesting. Um, and it's pretty it, interesting. Yeah. So it saves you time and you'll be more successful when you prioritize this way. So use last gift date the largest gift amount next, and lastly, the largest external gift that was found in your screening data. But the gift date is the key. All right, so major gift by the numbers. I want to make sure we have enough time. We have about 15 minutes. Um, so, you know, ultimately, what is fundraising about? It's about our missions and supporting our missions and, you know, raising money to support um, the programs and work of your organization. So what fundraising by the number means is really about these three things. It's, and I've said this a little bit before, it's about projecting the target ask of the prospects. It's also about projecting the estimated timing of major gift commitments. And then it's setting goals based on the major gift prospect pi pipeline. So this quantification of your pool is basically pipeline development. And I think we've probably heard so we wanted to move these donors through that pipe, through that major gift pipeline. But you have to have some parameters on that pipeline. So it's your target ask and your target timing. So I kind of think we talked about this, but this, you know, when you quantify the pipeline, what's so nice about this is you know where you are at any point in time. You know what opportunity is sitting in front of you at any point in time. And you can begin to project what you may raise on an annual basis from your major gift work. So what we have done is that we have made a massive chart of the prospects that are who are in play. And we have estimated, especially the top prospects, the uh, high and low of their gift and the probability and the timing. 
and you might do this according to segments of donors. But you should be able to quantify your entire major gift prospect pool so that you know what's what the pipeline is. You know what's on the table, what's in play in terms of possibility for revenue coming in. Um, the, the major, this plan by the numbers makes people feel comfortable. It takes the smoke and mirrors away from major gift fundraising and capital campaign fundraising. And it helps people feel, know, know where we are. And we find that it keeps boards quiet and happy, right, Catherine? It really does, Gail, because, and we see that too with campaign committees, because we use very similar, very almost identical process with campaigns that we just call campaign by the numbers. So as we develop with a client the campaign prospect pool, we have them quantify it. And we use some very simple reports. I'll show you one in just a minute, um, kind of a worksheet, but you can actually track all of this in your database as well. So we usually have clients kind of start initially with a worksheet just to kind of get their heads around the process. And then you can utilize it and, you know, or employ your database in order to manage it. So it's very manageable. And we have this lovely, I don't have this on in a slide, but we have this lovely summary prospect table that shows where a campaign is any moment in time with prospects that have been identified and, and prospects that have already, gifts have already closed. And it just calms down campaign committee, committee members and board members. Just everybody takes a deep breath because they know exactly where their campaign is. They know exactly how, what they can, how, how they're going to be successful. It just, it's very, um, it's just very important and I think very helpful to volunteers. Yeah, and I will say we will not be sharing that um, that that template because that's sort of our, the guts of our major mm -hmm. gift at capital campaign management strategy. Um, but if you uh, if you join the major gifts intensive, we'll teach you all about it and how to use it. Um, I do want to say um, that uh, somebody uh, Ashley has uh, all the the board members are holding the major donor relationships, and that is really a very specialized situation that needs very specialized approaches. Um, that we're not really covering today, but I feel your pain, Ashley. And mm -hmm. uh, you can email me privately. My email is gp at gailperry.com. And um, it's G A I L. And, um, and I'll, I'll give you some strategies because I do, I'm a board member and fundraising specialist. So look at so, this assigning values. Assigning prospect values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we, we see sometimes that people are like, well, I'm not 100% sure that's the right amount or whatever. You really need to get beyond being 100% sure. There's no such thing as 100% sure <laughs> in major <laughs> gift fundraising, I believe, um, until the donors actually made the gift. But you can make an educated analysis of this based on data that you have. And you, if you have the well screen, you can use that and also based on the strength of the relationship you have, which is very important um, to estimating, also estimating um, the donor's uh, potential giving amount. And keep in mind, as the relationship deepens and you learn more about the donor, their passions, their timing, um, what it is they want to support, how they want to do it, um, you, you change these numbers. So they evolve over time, but as long that's as you're so making an, an mm -hmm, as long as you're making an, a, an educated guess based on informed um, analysis, you will be comfortable. You will have numbers that are pretty real. Mm -hmm. We have clients who who uh, who free, get frozen in fright at the idea of putting a number or target ask or hope for ask next to a, a a name of a prospect, and they're trying to run a capital campaign. And we've had to get them over the hump. It's okay. You, you'll probably end up changing this number. Like we said earlier at the beginning, uh, this, this stuff is fluid. But you use your best, best, best estimate. And your estimate is probably pretty good because you have a gut feel for where this client stands. You need to trust it. Mm -hmm. And so this is just an example. Again, you can run reports like this straight from your CRM if you've coded your donors um, with these this kind of information. But here is just an example of, um, you know, if you have a small cadre of major gift prospects, you can certainly manage them using a sheet like this. You notice you've got top 10, next 20. You can inform your discovery uh, on, on this as well. So it's just, again, another way to kind of be able to monitor what's going on with your major gift pool at any point in time. 
And then basically what this, now that you, you've done all this wonderful stuff, you've had, you've done your analysis, you've done the segmentation or grouping of your prospect pool, you know which group you're doing discovery with, you know who your prospects are, um, you have a value of your prospects, you know when you estimated timing, you know what your steps are going to be. You have, that is your major gift plan. Right here, right here quantified into numbers because you've got to have the data. You've got to have it grounded in reality-based data. Everybody works on a prospect list or a prospect pool, and everybody has works with numbers in terms of where does the client stand, where does the prospect stand, and what's the likelihood and the timing, and being able to put it all down in a massive uh, chart and summarize it, that's key. That's your pipeline. That's your mm -hmm. capital campaign pipeline, your principal gift pipeline, your major gift pipeline. Um, people run leadership annual fund programs like this as well. And so you and so from from it's very important that you know because it's interesting when we 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 are very focused in major gifts about the relationship, but that doesn't mean that our program doesn't have structure, goals, things we measure, things we track. Um, it takes discipline. I mean, the investment of time in major gift fundraising is the one you will get the greatest return from. It's a major, as you know, as everybody knows on this call, I'm sure is major gift fundraising has the highest ROI of all the possible fundraising strategies available. It has the, um, it's the most effective and the most efficient way to raise money from your mission. And guess what, everybody, this is the path. This is the path. It's not that hard. Pull out your mm -hmm. Sherlock Holmes hat and make thank you calls. We had one of our one of our major gift intensive people made a thank you call on a donor, and she knew the questions to ask. This donor had been giving a thousand dollars a year, and and bless her heart, our client knew knew the questions to ask. And the donor said, "I want to make a hundred thousand dollar gift to support your work," and without asking, without asking, so this she turned a thousand dollar thank you phone call into a hundred thousand dollar gift without asking. Mm -hmm. So this stuff works. She knew she was talking to the right person and she knew the questions to ask, the discovery process questions to ask. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. We love this it stuff. Really, it really is. And I, and I think, you know, you, if you really want to be successful in major gift fundraising. You have to set a plan. And you can see from this, it's not overly difficult. It's probably a lot easier in many ways to articulate your major gift plan than it is your annual giving plan. And but it, which one yields the most or should yield the big, as Gail said, the greatest return is your major gift plan. Well, you know, we have a comment that plan, you know, I was thinking I was thinking as I, the words came out of my mouth, whether planned gifts had a higher ROI than major gifts. Um, and so I, I will stand corrected by Sandy McNabb that probably um, um, that planned gifts are. But also planned gifts come from your data analysis, mm -hmm. hopefully that you are sending the plan giving appeals to the legacy appeals to the right people based on your data analysis here. Mm -hmm. Right. And when, if you do a donor search screening, donor search has a code for uh, PGID, which indicates that the person is likely to make a plan has to do with likelihood of making a plan gift, but there are also other data points you can, you can, um, you do the segment. This is one segmentation, but you can do others. So you could do the plan giving ID, or and real estate um, would be yeah, one right. another way to segment. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that's right. yeah, and so you you know so that you can focus your um, plan giving communications with donors. So that you know that can be um, so that mm -hmm. can be there are lots of and you can use the same segmentation to find um, mid level donors and annual giving leadership donors. Mm -hmm. So the strategies. Yeah. We focused on the major gift one today with the way this works, but your screening data has, um, you know, to really make it actionable, you create your model, what it is you want to know about. Again, two data points minimally, three is better. Um, and similar to that evaluation grid, or you can use that as your basis and then create little models within the quadrants mm -hmm. <laughs> and say, this is how we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Plant a flag. Mm -hmm. um, Make some, you have to work off some assumptions, and uh, but you they'll work if you're consistent. Mm -hmm. So, Catherine, go back. Um, I'm going to add, why don't you give us your key takeaways 
in the chat box. We would love to know the Q&A box. We'd love to know your key takeaways. We can also take a couple of questions. I think we have a few minutes. Um, and we, we put this program together and we forgot to put our email address in here. So we are gailperry.com and there's a contact form um, uh, that you can find us. And can you move the slides back? Or Jay, can you move the slides back to the agenda, please? Um, I can. Yeah, oh, great, great, Catherine. And uh, my email address is gp at gailperry.com. Happy to receive your questions. Or uh, if you're planning or thinking about a capital campaign, that's our specialty. And our campaigns are going over goal. Listen to this, in the silent phase. We're oh. taking our campaigns over goal in the silent phase. So um, who um, who wants ice cream with the cherry on top of the Sunday today? And who has a question? So good, thank you so much. Um, and Kimberly said she had no idea we could get RFM from donor search. So I, frankly, I'll tell you what this, what else, I think people are not getting the most out of their relationship with donor search. They're paying for the screening and they say, oh, we have well screening, oh, we do it, but you're not pulling the data right and you're not doing the analysis right. And so you, so, you sort of have this mass of, of information, but it's not actionable and there's no plan. And so what we tried to show you today is that if you take the time to really drill down into your data and in your wealth screening reports, you're gonna find exactly what you need to know in order to surpass your fundraising goals. So this, this is not rocket science. I mean, it's, it, it takes some focus and it takes some strategy, but it can easily be done because you can see uh, our approach has worked very well and our clients are not necessarily data specialists or modeling specialists, but they can follow this program and so can you. And we will send you the slides. Um, I'm hoping that um, Jay will give us the attendee list. And if he doesn't, send me an email and we will send you the slides. What do you think, Jay? Can you give us the attendee list? Of, of course. Uh, and not only that, I didn't want to interrupt any of this because you're still offering so much great uh, information. But for those who are hanging on here, not only will we, we be providing uh, this list to Gail and Catherine so they can share the slides with you, but also a recording of this is being posted to the Donor Search YouTube channel. Right. So you'll see this in about one week along with all the other masterminds sessions. So please do look for this because while the slide deck is gonna be great for those of you who have been here, you probably have a colleague or two who didn't sit in with you. And you're That's gonna right. need them to be in you know, a little bit of this uh, wonderful ice cream indoctrination so you can get them to do the things they need to do. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Gail. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. And, you know, Catherine, I'm looking at ta key takeaways and people really liked the $10,000 uh, under 10 to us and over 10,000 to other organizations. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is a data point that you can you can hang your hat on. Mm -hmm. You really can. I mean, we as, I, as we said several times, every time we run this segmentation for a client, they they find nuggets. They find these like sleeper donors. They had no idea and they close major gifts immediately. Yeah, um, exactly. with, with that. Can you move to the major gifts intensive um, page yes. as well? Because somebody has asked for that. Um, like I said, a little bit more about major gifts intensive. We do this every year. We update the curriculum every year. It's live. It is not recorded. There are group coaching calls. There are private coaching calls. There's seven core foundational webinars that Catherine and I teach ourselves. And we uh, that's seven bonus, five bonus webinars on other topics, one for your board members. Uh, one on donor search, and uh, we'd love to talk to you if you think it's a fit. So go to majorgiftscoaching.com. We are closing applications or letters of interest um, February 23rd, and we'll be starting March 9th. So it'll just it'll be fast-paced, advanced program March, March, April, May, and June of this year. And if you're thinking about a capital campaign, this is the place to start because we're going to help you. Uh, identify your major gift prospects and capital campaign prospects and start discovering, my friends. And let's close some lead gifts for your campaign before your campaign starts. That's even better. So we it's, see it's really things. is. And, and we, you know, one of the things we really do help people just shorten the time between identification and actually having a what we call a gift conversation. Mm hmm. You do not have to. You do not have to spend a lot of time. You will be closing major gifts before the course is over. Yeah, and you know, no, if, you know use they... your, if you do your donor search screening as well, that um, mm -hmm. you find the donors to talk to, who are ready to give you substantial gifts. So this is why we love donor search. We love wealth screening, and and I love Teresa Sanchez's takeaway. She said her takeaway was 
in today's world, there are major donors ready to give. Thank you. Yes, yes, Teresa. There are major donors ready to give. I did want to remind everyone that uh, in addition to being able to take advantage of uh, what we're talking about here with the major gifts intensive, but also all the work that Gail and Catherine do, uh, that you can also, if you're interested, talk to a representative from the screening company you work with. That's uh, likely donor search, but it may be someone else. I hope you'll reach out to them also for some of the technical uh, elements of the service, because as Gail was just saying, there are lots of things that people do not take advantage of. They make the investment, the product, and uh, some of the benefit will be brought to you by people like Gail and Catherine who know how to put this into practice and raise some significant money in a campaign environment. But also it's helpful to just develop that relationship with the person who has provided the product to you. Make sure that you can take full advantage of all the elements. We've had questions here about the plant giving elements, RFM analysis, uh, all these things are within your product suite please do reach out to your your representative today. You'll find, especially donor search, they're easily accessible by phone mm -hmm. or by email. Mm -hmm. Well, it's our real pleasure to work with you today. So excited to see all the different types of nonprofit institutions around the country and the world. We are so with you uh, in the fight to make this world a better place. And if we can help you in any way, we'd love to. We have a Friday newsletter. You can go to our website and sign up for our Friday newsletter. It's uh, a cheerful dose of Catherine's in my thinking every Friday morning. Uh, hopefully it's a pep, pep you up and you can do it um, approach to, to big money, big ticket fundraising. So we really invite everybody to subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, let us know and we'll send you the slides. And uh, we look forward to being able to help you and your team achieve your fundraising potential. Thanks so much. Thank you all. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. Thank you both very much for, for being here. If you are new to this, uh, I hope you've enjoyed yourselves. I think you have. We've held on to the entire crowd throughout, and that means that, of course, you're interested in the subject matter. We do this every single week. There will be 90 programs this year, ranging from webinars like this one, they're CFRE accredited, to uh, webcasts where we have general discussions on topics of interest in fundraising, to a deep dive podcast with some of the leaders in the field that you can listen to when you're taking a walk, going grocery shopping, or doing whatever else you might like to do. You'll find all that at the DonorSearch site at DonorSearch.net. And if you are interested in more about the company itself, you can always just click that little button you'll see on your screen for a demo. So uh, do join us next week. We're going to have, in fact, Cannon Brook from Chapman University talking about the algebra of a high-performing research shop. That's on Tuesday, February 8th. And then in the following week, weeks, Beth Sheba Philpot, who's at the American Council on Education, talking about corporate foundation giving, et cetera, et cetera. Look for that calendar once again at DonorSearch.net. Until then, take care of yourselves, stay healthy out there, and we'll see you soon. Bye. Take care. Bye.